Um, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Hill. I am president of the British Bee Veterinary Association. And uh, welcome to the series of webinars on um, uh, really on bee related uh, subjects. I'm delighted this evening that we welcome Dr. Una Fitzpatrick from the National Di Biodiversity Data Center in Southern Ireland. And, um, uh, and she will in fact be talking this evening on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Now, uh, I would like to say this particular um, webinar is being sponsored by Northern Bee Books. Uh, for those of you who are beekeepers will know that uh, that Northern Bee Books are a quite a remarkable uh, company that sell an incredible variety of bee books of all sorts and in fact are uh, very, uh, very central to an awful lot of the, of the bee organisations and the, the bee events in Britain. So thank you very much indeed to Northern Bee Books for their very, very kind sponsorship. So uh, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Una Fitzpatrick from, as I say, from the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Now, Una has a PhD in botany. She worked on a project on the conservation of Irish bees before joining the National Biodiversity Data Centre in 2007. The centre is responsible for the collection, collation, management, analysis, and dissemination of data on Ireland's biological diversity. As senior ecologist, she is responsible for the plant, vegetation, and pollinator work programs of the centre. And in 2015, she co-founded the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. She is chair of the steering groups and also oversees implement, implementation of the plan. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to pass over to Dr. Unifitz, uh, uh, Dr. Unifitz uh, Patrick for this evening's webinar. Una. Thanks very much, John. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening and, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, I'm just gonna try to share my screen so you can let me know if this works okay, John. If you can yes, see, can you see it okay? Yes, Brilliant. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you this evening about the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and how we've been using it really to encourage biodiversity action across all sectors here in Ireland. Um, as John said, I work in the National Biodiversity Data Centre and it's sort of like a central statistics office, but for plant and animal information. So we manage information on Ireland's wildlife and track you know, where it is and how it's changing. And we have amazing biodiversity in Ireland. There's 31 and a half thousand different species in, in, in over 100 different habitats. Unfortunately, you know, as we all know, at this stage in Ireland and, and really elsewhere around the globe, biodiversity loss is a huge problem. And I think it can be really difficult to feel empowered to do anything about that because biodiversity itself is quite complex. So it's hard to know how to help. So what can be really useful is to identify simple vehicles that can be used to sell a biodiversity message to a very wide audience. And thankfully, pollinators are, are just perfect for this. You know, they're an element of biodiversity that people can understand and relate to. I think everyone likes bees. You can communicate about them in a really clean and simple way. You can easily monitor changes. And really importantly, when you protect pollinators, that has knock-on benefits for biodiversity generally. Unfortunately, the plight of pollinators is typical, you know, of many components for biodiversity here in Ireland. We've got 101 different bee species, so there's the honeybee, you know, that I was most familiar with, it's a domesticated pollinator. But then we have 21 different bumblebees in Ireland, and we've got 79 different solitary bees. And unfortunately, of those 100 wild bee species, one third are threatened to the extinction from the island of Ireland. And, you know, that's bad enough. And in some ways, you know, when you, when you lose habitats, that's the kind of thing that you expect to see. But you might imagine, well, surely the common wild pollinators, you know, the common bumblebees, they're probably doing okay. And unfortunately, uh, not. So we have a citizen science scheme within the centre called the Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme. And really, what that scheme has shown us is that since we started in 2012, the abundance of our common bumblebees has declined since we started measuring it. You know, so really, really worrying trends right across the board. 
And I suppose rare species disappearing through the loss of, of semi-natural habitats, but those common species are declining in abundance as a consequence of how we're managing the rest of the landscape. So I think if there's a problem, you know, what do you do? Well, you have to decide if it's important, then critically assess it and how serious it is, and then identify the causes. And I suppose that's what happened, what's happening, you know, within the centre. I was tracking change in, in bees. I was watching them declining. At the same time, you know, I've got a colleague in, in Trinity College Dublin, Professor Jane Stout, and she was researching, you know, why it was happening, what we could do about it. So Jane and I came together and said, you know, listen, there's a problem here. It is serious. We know what's causing it. And we know what we could do about it. So we said we have to try to you know, come together and put together some sort of positive framework going forward. And that's really where the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan came from. So Jane and I put together the first draft and then we called a steering group from right across the island to develop it. And, and through the steering group, then we published it. And again, you know, the steering group have, have been fantastic and, and just to pay credit actually to the Ulster Beekeepers, um, we've been on the steering group right from the very start and, you know, and have been hugely influential in helping to drive the whole thing. But once you have a plan, I think you have to identify evidence-based actions to help. You have to communicate those properly. You have to work together where you can, and then you have to track progress. You know, is what you're trying to do actually working? It's really the, the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. It's a call to action to everyone. And I always say, you know, if you want to help implement it, it's about thinking about your site and can it provide food, shelter, and safety for bees? You know, everyone can help. So many people have some responsibility for a piece of land, you know, whether it's the smallest wind box or the biggest farm. So many of us have, do have responsibility for a piece of land somewhere. And if you do, you know, we can all help make that a better place for bees. And in doing that, you're helping to protect biodiversity generally. So these are Ireland's wild bees. I know that you know all about honeybees. So I'm just going to tell you about some of my favourites wild bee species in Ireland. I could probably talk about all 100 if I'm totally honest, but I won't. Don't worry, John. Um, I'm just going to tell you about some of the ones that, that I like the best. Um, this is a gorgeous little species. You find it on coastal sites where it, you know, it lives in sand dunes. It's called the gold fringed mason bee. Um, and it makes its nest in empty snail shells. So it'll go off and you know collect bits of moss to make its nest in these empty snail shells. You only find it on coastal sites. Again, we find it, you know, it's common in Britain and, and we find it around the east coast in Ireland. There's another bee, um, also common in Britain, so I'm sure that some of the audience may have seen this in your garden, but in Ireland, this one was actually extinct for 87 years before reappearing again in 2012. And since then, it's been expanding its range, which is great to see. But yeah, it's a spring uh, mining bee, so again, really charismatic, you know, lovely looking insect, makes these little volcano nests where it burrows in, into bare soil. Here's another one, the red mason bee. Um, this is one of the, another solitary bee, it's a cavity nester this time. And research has shown that one of these red mason bees can do the work of hundreds of honeybees. You know, that, that's how important these are as, as pollinators. And I'll say a wee bit about why they're so important um, in a minute. Just want to show you a slide, um, solitary bees, don't, don't hang around to raise their young. And I just wanted to show you a, a red mason bee nest progression. A beekeeper actually sent me this. They, they'd spotted it in their hive and they took photo, serious photographs over a number of weeks. It's just really interesting, I think, you know, to see how the nest develops. So um, red mason bees, they make these cells in their nest with mud. So the, the bee goes out and collects mud and makes cells, usually about 10, I think there's 10 there. Usually makes eight or 10 cells um, in, in cavities. And what it then does is it goes out and collects pollen from a range of different plant species. You can see the different coloured pollen there from different different plant species. And then the bee lays a fertilised egg on each of those little balls of food. You know, those develop into larvae which eat the food supply that the, the mum has left. And then the pupae will overwinter and, and emerge then as an adult the next year. You know, so you can see it's, you know, it's a simple life cycle, but fascinating to see it, you know, like that. And, and so important for them to have enough pollen to provision the cells at the time of year when they need to. This is a, a, our newest bee only arrived a couple of weeks ago. So again, you know, it's been in Britain. What happens in Ireland is that, you know, bees in Britain will reach a certain density. And then when the weather conditions are right, they'll get blown across the Irish Sea and arrive into the East Coast. So this is our latest arrival, the hairy-footed flower bee. So it was recorded from Dublin just, just a couple of weeks ago. So we're delighted to, to have this new addition to our into our wild beef one here. 
you know, it's great to see these these newbies arriving, but obviously at the other end of the spectrum, we are seeing others really in huge danger of extinction. So these are two you know, real charismatic bumblebees, rare in Britain and rare in Ireland, um, really on the verge of extinction, you know, the great yellow bumblebee and the shell carder bee. So there are species that are in enormous difficulties, you know, and if we want to save them, we have to, we, re we really have to act you know, Im immediately. Um, just to say, you know, a lot of people might not be hugely aware of solitary bees, despite them, you know, being there when you get your eye and you see them everywhere, but, you know, most people don't really notice them. You say, well, how important are, there, are they actually as pollinators? And the answer is they're incredibly important. So, you know, as, as you probably know, the honeybee and bumblebees, they store the pollen pellet as a moist pellet on the hind leg. And so they're brilliant, both really efficient, particularly honeybees, obviously, but both really efficient at going out collecting pollen and bringing a lot of it back to their to their hive or to their nest. Um, most solitary bees also store the pollen pellet on their hind leg, but they don't moisten it. So they store it as a dry or a loose pellet packed into the hairs. So you can see it there. And you can imagine yourself in that case, a lot more of the pollen gets dispersed around the flower as they move from flower to flower, which makes them, you know, obviously better pollinators. And then there's one particular group, which are the mason bees. So the one I just showed you, the red mason bee, and the leaf cutter solitary bees. So they haven't evolved to store pollen on the back leg. Instead, they store it on the underside of their abdomen. So they pack it into the hairs on the underside of their abdomen. It's so really inefficient. You can imagine, you know, the pollen's going everywhere, you know, as they move from flower to flower, which makes them really super pollinators, but obviously less efficient for them. So they're doing a lot more trips. So these bees are brilliant pollinators. And that's the reason why one of them, you know, they say can do the work of, of over a hundred honey bees. So really pollinators need food, shelter and safety. And it's all very well, you know, saying that and asking people to help unless you describe exactly what it is that you're asking them to do. So within the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, what we wanted to do was to identify evidence-based actions for different sectors and target those really carefully, you know, to, to the audience. So we've been producing these booklets, um, as I say, for different sectors, you know, there's one for schools, one for farms, councils, local communities, businesses, gardens, transport authorities, and so on. And what we've done each time is look at all the, the possible actions and then look at the science behind it all and only select those that are evidence-based so that, that, that will work. Um, what we do then is work with the relevant sector to identify those that are realistic and pragmatic. And then also work with them to make sure that the language is right each time and that, that you're tailoring the communication to the sector in a way that will make most sense to them. So these are all um, freely available on the website, pollinators.ie, and so they each has lots of different actions that that sector can take to help, to help pollinators. There's another series of how-to guides for some of the more complicated actions, and then a third that series for, for sort of more site-specific situations, you know, like golf courses sports clubs and wind farms and so on. And, you know, thank you for an enormous interest in, in the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, which is fantastic. And I suppose these are, I never imagined how many of these we're going to end up with, but they, they're showing no signs of slowing down, which, which is really positive. Once we have these, I try to um, use existing networks and partnerships to, to, to roll them out. And to be honest, we've never developed one of these guidelines unless we knew that there was some sort of distribution channel in place to enable us to get it out when we had it. So, you know, like for, for example, with the schools, when eco schools and green schools have been really important. And again, each time we, you know, we've worked with the right network to try and get this information out to the right people. Something else I suppose that we've learned is that you have to make the information accessible. So, and free, you know, so for us, the website is, is really important and you know, all those guidelines are on there along with videos and animations, you know, blogs and signage templates and flyers and all sorts. So really we try to use the website as sort of a one-stop shop where people can come along, you know, look at it at their leisure and, and hopefully get the information that they need if, if they want to help. Something else that we've learned from the, from the pollinator plan is you know, you have to continuously exchange knowledge. There's so much to learn and, and we always want it, the initiative to, to do that and to be able to evolve and adapt. So that, that's a huge part of it. And we do it in lots of different ways. You know, there's a monthly newsletter to keep people up to date. Obviously, social media is really important. We have lots of knowledge exchange events and also, you know, knowledge exchange blogs. And we try this ideas hub on the website. So just 
continuously learning from what's happening. And then once something really positive is happening, we're trying to, you know, spread the light to, to as many other people as possible. So just going to tell you a wee bit about the impact that the plan has had to date. So as John said, the, the first Solar Island Pollinator Plan runs from 2015 to 2020. Um, so just to tell you a, a little bit about, about what happened, you know, in that plan, we had 81 actions and, and they were largely all delivered. This stage, 86, it's actually gone up a little bit over the last week, but, but 88, 88% 88 of councils have become partners. So they've formally committed to partner with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and agree to take action on the land that they manage and agree to report to us on what it is that they're doing each year. And um, parks have become pollinator friendly through a special award in the Green Flag for Parks competition, which again has been really positive. We've got another um, framework for business supporters. So if you're a business, regardless of your type um, or size, you know, you can sign up as a supporter of the plan. And again, there's guidelines you know, to show you the types of actions that you can take. But in becoming a business supporter, you agree to take actions to help and you agree to report once a year to us on, on what it is that you're doing. Those reports then are made publicly available. So at the minute we've got over, there's over 330, these numbers go up all the time, um, that there's, well, there's about 349 business supporters um, and, and that grows, you know, almost daily, thankfully, which is fantastic. We also got funding for a research project, you know, and if we're all being honest, if farmland is, is the most important sector that we need to target. And what we wanted to do into the future is make sure that we're identifying the right actions for farmers and the right mechanisms to allow farmers to roll them out in a way that works for the farm as a business. So we did get funding for this research project called Protecting Farm and Pollinators, and it's working with a group of 40 farmers in an area in Ireland, in, in County Kildare. And we, cho we chose 40 farmers across types and across intensity levels. And what we've been doing is identifying this scoring system. So it's a whole farm scoring system. So a farmer can look at the different habitats they have on their farm and how much of them they have, and they get a farm scale pollinator score which tells them how good their farm is. We've done a lot of you know, work then behind the scenes in terms of, of monitoring of those farms to show that that score works. And you know, it's been, it's been fantastic, I suppose. It's about working with those 40 farmers and learning from them to identify a mechanism that, that works and that's realistic and that farmers can you know, see what their score is and they can see the really simple changes they can make to improve it. And it gives them the choice to make the changes that work for their farm, you know, as a business. Not, you know, not all farms are the same, same way that, you know, not all gardens or not all councils are the same. So we wanted to have that flexibility. We also had a pollinator award in Ireland. There's a Tidy Times competition, um, which, which is incredible. It's about 900 entries each year in this Tidy Times competition. And within that, we have had a special pollinator award since 2016. And really, it's just been incredible. You know, over 200 of towns and villages have entered at this stage. And, and that means that they've really gone to huge effort to make their local area more pollinator friendly. And some of them have just made the most incredible changes. And, and I was say of the one sector, they're probably the most inspiring one because, you know, obviously tidy towns would traditionally have been about making their local area more tidy. But they've really, really embraced this and brought biodiversity back into local areas, which, which is fantastic to see. Schools have become pollinator friendly. And again, as I said, we've been working with green schools and eco schools here. We've also just this year actually um, connected with, with a retailer with Super Value Hero Supermarket. Um, and they launched a national campaign, which is running at the minute in Ireland. And they've sent out pollinator resources that we developed in collaboration with them to all primary schools in the Republic of Ireland, you know, which is fantastic just to get the message out to, to really so that huge wide audience. Then the National Biodiversity Data Centre we developed this special online mapping system just to enable us to track what was happening. Um, and what you can do is if your site, regardless of what type it is, is, is helping, you can draw around your site and say what it is that you're doing. Uh, and to date, um, over 7,000 different actions have been logged. And again, you know, that, that, that increases all the time. And there's probably only a fraction of, of those that are actually taking place. What we're finding is that more people are engaging with nature, you know, which is fantastic. And since we launched the plan, the number of people that are recording wild bees has increased by, by 300%, which is amazing. And, and I think we all saw that during COVID times, how important nature is to us. 
and the solace that it, that it brings to us. And certainly, you know, we saw that during COVID, but we've also seen it, you know, even before that, people really are realizing how important nature is and, and, and reconnecting with it and, and trying to take action that, that will help protect and restore it. We also have an Irish Pollination Research Network in Ireland. So this is established by Jane in, in Trinity originally and has just continued to grow and grow. And, and their work is obviously so important because they're researching all the time, you know, what actions we should be taking, why bees are declining, all these kind of issues. And their work feeds them back into the initiative and lets us ensure that everything we're suggesting is evidence-based and is as up-to-date as, as we can make it. I suppose thanks to the, the huge amount of support that we've got and, and we're always so grateful to the people who have engaged with the plan and who have partnered with us and who are, you know, making it work. And it has been, been regarded as a success story internationally. We have spoken to lots and lots of other countries, you know, on, on what we've done in Ireland and in, in the hope that, that they might learn from us in the same way, you know, that there's so much that we can learn from, from others. Again, if, if you want to see a wee bit more about some of the key successes, we published this booklet to, mark the, to celebrate the end of the first phase, 2015 to 2020. And really in this, we just pulled together some of the positive stories from across all sectors. So I put down the link there. And if, if you're interested, you know, you, you can have a wee look at the different kinds of things that have been happening. Just want to say a bit about the kind of actions that we recommend because they're always going on and on make you know everyone can help everyone can become more pollinator friendly and say well what are you actually talking about so i just wanted to touch on this for a wee bit and there's there's two key actions you know and i think we have to accept that biodiversity is in crisis and it's in crisis because we're losing habitats and that, as I said at the start, you know, it can be difficult to feel empowered on that. And, and that's true. So for a lot of habitats, there's not very much that, you know, as a member of the public, you can do about them. You know, so there's not very much you can probably do about sand dunes declining or, you know, native woodland, maybe, you know. But there are some that we can help. And there are two actions that are just crucial in this respect and that we can take that will help to return habitats. And that's sustainable and a long term biodiversity action. And those two actions are in spring to have more flowering native hedgerows and trees. Again, incredibly important action because when you know hedgerows across farmland, across public land, you know, on the edges of big gardens, schools, so many places where we do have hedgerows. And if we just manage those native hedgerows to allow them to flower in spring, the impact would be huge. You know, they're providing food, but they're also providing incredibly important corridors across the landscape. The second action then is in summer, which is to have more native meadows. And, and you probably know, you know, I think the figure in Britain is that they've lost, that you've lost 98% of your native meadows. We don't have the exact figure in Ireland, but you know, it's no doubt very similar. And that has been catastrophic to biodiversity. It really has. So a key action in spring and summer is to help return those native meadows, you know, in pockets, however small. I just want to touch on this native meadow because this really is so important. And it's this whole idea of don't mow, let it grow. And often an action as simple as just not cutting the grass so often is the best and the cheapest way to provide more food for pollinators. You know, I'm showing you that photograph there and you can see um, there's three different grass cutting regimes. There's cut regularly, you know, cut less frequently, maybe once a month. And then there's cut just once a year, it's providing food and shelter. You know, and you can imagine if you're a bee, you know, you're not done with that, but you love these two. And it's so simple to help. You know, we can all do this if we have a piece of grass. If you're not planting anything, all you're doing is just reducing mowing and allows these little seeds in the soil a chance to come up that we would normally just chop off, you know, with, with the lawnmower. Just to say, you know, if you want those grassy areas to become more flower rich on their own, you do have to take the cuttings away. So if you're removing the grass each time, it's lower in the soil fertility. And what that does is it gives the wildflowers a chance to compete with the more um, aggressive grasses. So the lower the soil fertility, the more flowers you're going to get. We've got lots of tips and resources and videos to help you do this on, on the website. And again, you can do it in all sorts of ways. You know, this garden has just, you know, cut around clover, such a simple thing to do. But when I visit it, you could smell the clover on the way to, to the garden and you could hear a buzzing, you know, with bumblebees in this case, you know, long before you actually reached it. Again, I know I labour this, but so important, you know, this don't mow let it grow is such an important biodiversity action. And what it's doing is it's returning really simple flowers. So it's the dandelions and the daisies and the buttercups and the clovers, you know, and cuckoo flower at this time of year. 
they are so important to our pollinators. That is what they want us to return. That's what they need us to return if we want to help them. So really important biodiversity action and what you're doing is slowly, slowly, in small ways, sustainably returning that really important grassland habitat. And you're providing pollinators with the flowers that they need. There is another action that people um, often focus on and that is they decide, you know, that a better way to do that would be to go and buy a packet of wildflower seed and to plant that. Um, that's a totally different thing that you're doing, if that's the case. You know, planting wildflower seed, that's a horticultural action or a garden action. We always say that, you know, don't, please don't do that outside garden settings. And you should never plant, you know, wildflower seed mixes in habitats that you could naturally return and naturally bring back that biodiversity habitat. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing this in your garden, but I suppose it's just being aware that it is a garden or a horticultural action and essentially you're growing, you know, a mix of flowers that would never grow together in nature. They may not be native to your country, they may not be good for pollinators. Um, so really, you know, that this is a lovely, colourful flower bed, whereas, you know, if you're going through the don't know that it grow approach, you're gradually returning the habitat. So I suppose we always just ask people to be aware of these two and just to think carefully about the one, you know, that, that, that you choose to do. The other types of recommended actions then are obviously, you know, around reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides, um, both insecticides, you know, fungicides and then herbicides. You know, I think we all know places like this and you go, oh God, I'm not sure there's any need really for, you know, for this spraying. Um, so it's about moving away from, from that. There's lots of actions that you can take to create nests and habitat for wild bees. I'll say a wee tiny bit more about it in a bit, but, you know, really, really easy to do. And then, of course, you know, you can ease, you can choose nectar and pollen rich um, garden plants, you know, for your garden, schools, parks and so on, which can be incredibly important, particularly at certain times of year when there are, you know, there are hunger gaps for, for bees within the wider landscape. Just want to mention some of the actions that we need to be really careful of. Um, and one is that we need to make sure that we don't have too many honeybees in the landscape and that we need to balance managed and wild pollinators. You know, there's increasing studies on this and we all know, you know, how important beekeeping is, but we need to make sure that we don't have too many, to, to be honest. And as I say, there are more and more studies coming out on this all the time, but there's one, I haven't got it on there, but there was a Swiss one just very recently, which showed, you know, that it looked at six Swiss cities and that really the urban beekeeping was not sustainable with biodiversity in those cities. So we do need to be really careful. And, and we've been doing that within the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. So the beekeeping associations have been, you know, really supportive. And I suppose what we've been trying to do is lots of people are saying, oh, I really want to help bees. The best way to do it is to get a hive of honeybees. So they're not really interested in beekeeping. What they want to do is help bees. And there's much better actions that they could take, you know, by making the garden more pollinator friendly. We're taking really simple actions to help the decline in wild pollinators. So I suppose we've been working with beekeeping associations just to make sure that that message is getting out initially and that it's in, you know, courses and and communications, you know, to new beekeepers that, you know, to make sure that people who take on beekeeping actually want to do it, you know, as, as a hobby and that they're not, that they're not mistakenly think that's the best thing to do to help decline in bee populations. Also trying to make sure that where people are getting new hives, for whatever reason, that they are joining their local association to make sure that they're keeping healthy honey bees. So obviously, you know, you know, bees with diseases are going to spread those bees, those diseases into the wild populations as well, which, which can be hugely difficult when, when they're already in such difficulties. Also, obviously, we need to do more research in the Irish context, and that is happening to see, you know, what that balance is. It's all very well to say, well, we need to balance the two, unless you say, well, here's the density that we need of hives and so on. So that research, you know, it, it is ongoing. But I think in the meantime, you know, it is really important that we err on the side of caution and that we don't place hives, you know, in, in national parks or in areas that are close to rare and threatened wild bee species. Something else we need to do is to be really careful that we don't end up planting in a way that's detrimental to biodiversity. And I touched on this before, a huge part of that are these wildflower seed mixes. This, you might think, looks lovely, but, you know, that's a very colourful flower bed and you think, OK, but, you know, that's in, in the wider landscape and it's actually in an area of Dublin where if you let that 
um, come back on its own, it would be a lovely coastal grassland habitat. And it's actually a place where you get a really rare species, the, the prickly poppy, which is red listed in Ireland, occurs in this area. You know, so probably what happened with that would have been sprayed off and this mix put down, which is not native. You know, whereas you could have brought back this lovely native grassland and protect this, you know, really rare plant species at the same time. So you need to be really careful with these mixes, that they're not being used inappropriately and that they're being kept to garden settings. Also, you know, we need to be sure that we're not putting on native trees when we're trying to restore native habitats. And I know sometimes, um, and not, not singling out beekeepers, but you know, there is a temptation to put in things like lime that, that might flower at a time when, you know, in, when honeybees need, need food, but we need to be really careful, you know, there's a place for that, but it's not when you're trying to restore native habitats. And the other thing is we need to be really careful about invasive species. You know, this is brings tears to the eyes of ecologists when you see this, you know, along particularly around riparian habitats. You know, we've got Himalayan balsam, which when you picture, you know, the gorgeous diverse riparian habitat that you'd have if that wasn't there, you know, it, it really is heartbreaking. And, and once that comes in, it's it's almost impossible to return biodiversity in that situation. And again, you know, we need to ensure that the pollinator nesting actions are evidence-based. So very, very easy to do this. Bumblebees just need undisturbed long grass. You know, dead easy to do anywhere. Mine and solitary bees, they need bare patches of soil where they can burrow in, you know, ideally south or east facing banks. Again, so easy to do if you have a spade. And I'm just mentioning this because, you know, the cavity nesters, so we've got, there's a lot less cavity nesters in, in Ireland within the fauna and, and the same in Britain. Um, but people do often fixate on these, you know, with these bee boxes. So cavity nesters nest in existing cavities. So in nature, they'll do it in all sorts of little holes, you know, maybe walls, hollow stems like raspberry or blackberry. Um, or, or they do do it in, in bee boxes, but sometimes we find that people will, you know, we'll fixate on the bee boxes and some of them are so enormous, they nearly need planning permission. So we're saying, you know, do that, but you know, it's best to keep these bee boxes small. Um, so sort of bird box sized, if they're, if they're too big, they'll, you know, they'll just spread disease and, and they'll attract predators like birds. So it's best to keep them small and, and just be aware that, you know, they will only target a small number of species, whereas if you went out with speed and create a bare ground, you could probably target an awful lot more. So just to tell you a little bit about what we're planning in the next phase of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, so 2021 to 25. Um, so we want it to be more ambitious, but still, you know, remain realistic. So this time around, we've got six objectives. So one is making farmland pollinator friendly. The second one is making public land pollinator friendly, then making private land. It's fantastic this time around that, that we've managed to have an All Ireland honeybee strategy. So we wanted to have that as its own strategy, so it is its own and it has its own steering group, but it's, so it's standalone, but it also slots within the wider all iron and pollinator plan. And there's an objective on conserving rare pollinators, and then there's one on strategic coordination. So we may have lost the run of ourselves, so we went from 81 actions to 186, but um, you know, it, it, that's fantastic and you know, so much support from the partners, which, which is brilliant. And just to say, we didn't have a huge amount of funding the first time around, the first plan really was just myself, I work kind of part-time on it because I look after other projects as well. And then we had one project officer in the first phase, but thanks to the success, we have managed to get government support for this new phase. We now have three project officers, which, which is which is brilliant, you know, funded by various different um, government departments. And, and that's what has allowed us, you know, to go from that 81 action to the 186. Just to touch, I suppose, on some of the new ideas that we have for, for this next phase. Objective one is on farmland, so we want to do a lot more direct engagement with that sector, you know, a lot more training with farmers themselves. There's more evidence-based resources that we want to develop for, for the farmland sector. We want to better raise awareness by celebrating farmland pollinators and farmland biodiversity. You know, there's, there's amazing, gorgeous habitats on farmland. You know, I think it's really important that we celebrate those where they exist and, and, and encourage those farmers that are protecting them. And really important, we want to track changes. So we have, you know, got funding for a new national pollinator monitoring scheme, which is going to track changes across a network of 50 sites, which will be partly on farmland and partly on public land and some urban parks. So they'll be monitored, which will really create that really strong scientific data 
that will allow us to show the impact of the pollinator plant and, and show whether it's working into the future. Objective two is on making public land more pollinator friendly. Um, there we want to you know, ensure that everybody's taking the right action to help. And you know, I touched on, on that just now. We want to expand to new sectors. So health cares, um, we'd, we'd love to you know, encourage more hospitals and various other healthcare sites to become more pollinator friendly. Also working on a guideline for new housing developments at the minute. Lots of people are, are taking action, which is fantastic and we want to into the future try to join that up as much as possible so you're creating these ecological corridors that will allow pollinators and other biodiversity to move around the landscape better. I want to recognize sites that have decided to go pesticide free and also I think you know this one's important we've always talked about sorry talked about pollinators and you know when you take action to protect pollinators that's protecting biodiversity generally but what it's also doing those actions are also benefiting climate and they're also benefiting their own health and well-being. So we want to better stress and, and emphasize that in, in this next phase. Objective three is about making private land more pollinator friendly. And again, you know, we want to expand to new sectors. So we have been targeting sports clubs. We want to continue to use gardens for general awareness reason. And we want to grow and expand that network of business supporters. Objective four is um, the All Ireland Honeybee Strategy. And what we want to do here is, and what has been happening, is we want to ensure more collaboration within the sector. See, in, in Ireland, we've got various different associations, you know, and, and they're all represented on the steering group. And, and I've been in meetings with them. It's just been so positive and so constructive, you know, to come together and, and to identify all the issues and work on them together. So, you know, that, that's been, been a fantastic development so far. As I mentioned before, we need to ensure that honeybees and wild pollinators are part of a cohesive and balanced pollinator voice. Really importantly, and you know, far, far better than I do, you know, we need to make sure that there are healthy honeybees. And also, you know, we need to collect better data. I was talking, I get asked to talk to all sorts of countries and I was talking to a group in South Korea recently, and they're really interested in, you know, what we're doing on honeybees. And, but, you know, they're asking me, well, how many, what's the hive density? You know, what's your overwinter and loss figures? You know, unfortunately, we don't have that for the island of Ireland as a whole, which, which is a real shame. So I suppose into the future, we do need to, you know, look to ways to collect better data around those things on an island-wide level. Objective five then is about conserving rare pollinators. So we want to publish best practice advice. So we've already published a guidance document on the great yellow bumblebee and, there, and there's more in train. We want to link to policy, raise awareness and, and track change. And objective six is just strategic coordination. So, you know, what we've been trying to do is reach new audiences. So I've never spoken to vets before, so thank you for the opportunity to, to do this one. You know, it is fantastic to be able to reach new audiences, and I think that's so important for us. So say the Irish Pollinator Research Network, you know, they've identified new research priorities to support this new phase of the plan. And we've got a suite of databases behind the scenes that, that will support um, the rollout and show progress. And just um, coming towards the end, um, tracking progress is a hugely important part of it. I think because we didn't have to do the plan in Ireland, you know, it kind of came from the bottom up. We always wanted to do something that was actually going to have a positive impact. So tracking progress has always been a really big part of it. And we do it in three ways. You know, we track implementation of the actions in the plan. So now we're tracking implementation each year of those 186. And each partner who has responsibility for the action has to report and that's made publicly available each year in December. We have, we're also through this online mapping system that I mentioned, we're tracking the creation of pollinator habitat going back in. So we're tracking where food and shelter is going back into the landscape. But really importantly, and obviously most important, is that we're tracking changes in pollinators themselves within the landscape. That the All Ireland Pollinator Plan will only be a success, you know, if in 10, 20, 100 years' time there's more bumblebees and more solitary bees, we have more healthy pollinators in the landscape. And that's what we need to track. And that's what we do, obviously, within the National Biodiversity Data Centre. We have this National Pollinator Management Scheme, which is launching this year, but we've had for the last number of years various citizen science schemes, the Bumblebee Management Scheme, and also Flower Insect Time to Count, which is just 10 minutes to watch a patch of flowers and count the insects. 
And these schemes have been so important because it allows groups or individuals, to, you know, to track the impact of your own actions in your own local area, in your own garden, on your business property, whatever it happens to be. So just to end, I suppose I always like to know how to say, you know, how you can help. Um, and we can all help. I can still do more, you know, and I think everyone can still do more to, to play their part. And one really simple thing is just to make your own garden more pollinator friendly. And we have a Pledge Your Garden initiative and there's some resources, which is this resource last year, which shows you types of things you can do in your garden each month. And lots of things that you can plant and, and actions that you can take to make your own garden, a place where pollinators can survive and thrive. And you'd be amazed at the number of different wild pollinators you can have in, you know, in, a, in a small garden. Similarly, you can make your business property more pollinator friendly. Again, you know, regardless of, of the type or the size. So there's no reason why, you know, that we practices couldn't make their own business properties more pollinator friendly or, or whatever other businesses people might be interested in. And also, you know, we're always trying to learn new things. And if you have ideas, maybe you've seen something somewhere else, or maybe you think of something while I'm talking, like we're always really grateful where people share those with us um, to help us grow and, and expand this initiative. So just to end, you know, as I said before, we're really grateful for the amount of support that we've got for the plan, but I think, you know, be naive to think that sustaining long-term participation isn't going to be a challenge. You know, it is. And I think it needs to be built on trust and the experts running it. It needs to be built on acknowledgement of all the efforts that are being made. And really importantly, there has to be clear demonstrations that these actions we're taking are having a positive impact and are making a difference. And I think it is true, you know, lots of small actions taken together can begin to solve big problems. Um, and I'll end on that note, just to say thank you again for inviting me and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thanks. Right, Una, thank you very much indeed. That was extremely good. Um, very, very interesting is how um, over this last number of years that you've managed to create a, uh, you know, a policy for the whole of the island of Ireland and indeed you've done a huge amount of work for all those say guides and um, and uh, you know the publications that you come out with I, I think I would certainly say a lot of these are actually probably available on the um, on your website which is uh, pollinators.ie is that right? Um, yes, yeah. So certainly, uh, and I certainly would recommend uh, to everybody, indeed, that you could, should have a look at those because they are absolutely superb. Uh, anyways, I think if you have any questions, if you would care to please put them in the Q&A uh, section and, um, and we can certainly uh, put them to, uh, to Una. Certainly one of the questions I would certainly like to, to say is, okay, we are in the midst of... Um, um, really globally of an insect, uh, so what they call an insect apocalypse, this huge reduction in, in insect uh, biomass. And so there's some studies on that. And I suppose each and every one of us are probably aware of the idea uh, that um, as we drive around, we certainly don't really sort of have to clean our windscreens or, or, or headlights as often as we used to do. Certainly whenever I was... Uh, a teenager and first get in the car, I had to be very careful to make sure this my windscreen uh, was clean or the, or the headlights were clean or the grill was clean because my father would know if there was a pile of insects on it that they'd been driving too fast. So, uh, but indeed those days are gone. I mean, we, we just do not get the, the degree of, uh, of, um, of insects really um, showing up. And especially even at night, you don't get the sort of blizzard of moths that we used to see. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any studies, say, in, in Ireland itself uh, about that, you know? I suppose, yeah, no, it's a good question, John, and you're right. We can all see it with our own eyes, what's happening. Um, each time we've done, the, the best way to do a conservation assessment is to use formalised, you know, standardised, internationally recognised methodology, which, which is called red listing. So each time we've done red listing for insect groups in Ireland, we're finding, yeah, that, you know, on average, you know, one in five species is threatened with extinction. So yeah, what's happening globally is certainly being replicated in Ireland. You know, so each time, as I say, we do one of these red lists for an insect group, that's, that is what we're finding. Some groups, you know, in more trouble than others and, and bees in, in probably most trouble of all. Um, so yeah, no, it's certainly, 
yeah, it's no different here, unfortunately. Right, okay. Um, I maybe need to point out, actually, I do apologise, I should have explained this earlier, is that uh, 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 my colleague um, uh, Trevor Dawson is the Secretary of the Ulster Beekeepers Association, and he's actually helping me here this evening, although this webinar is indeed being promoted by the British Bee Veterinary Association. Um, it happens to be that I'm involved in both organisations, so that's why we're actually working closely together. So in case anybody's confused by the idea that they think this is a, a veterinary webinar and the Ulster Beekeepers are, are showing it, that is the reason. So uh, and the first question here, actually, uh, Una, is from Mary, and it said, should native Irish seed bombs be restricted to gardens? Yes, I would say definitely. Yeah, 100% restricted to gardens. Um, I would never, ever buy or plant a seed bomb, to be honest. You know, native plants devote huge resources to dispersing their seeds. The idea of clumping them all together in a bowl to plant makes no sense in nature. So, you know, it's a nice idea and it's it's obviously an easy way to gift things and all that, but, you know, don't make a huge amount of sense from a biological perspective. But yeah, I would definitely recommend that they're restricted to gardens. Okay, yeah, right, okay. Um, and, um, well, I suppose indeed, yeah, they're, they're very common, there's a lot of seed mixtures around. Um, uh, I think you mentioned about, say, uh, veterinary practices having, uh, you know, making better use of it around. And in fact, the British Bee Veterinary Association has been trying to promote that for people, say, to to put up, um, say, their um, um, uh, solitary bee boxes. And indeed, OK, we would have some seeds that would send around, but they're to plant around the actual search island window boxes within the city uh, and so forth. And indeed... I think we're certainly trying to get the green, but we will certainly take uh, it, it true because some veterinary practice are saying they've got quite a big areas to sow. So we'll take a take and give an advice to that extent, not to rush out to get huge amounts of these uh, wildflower mixtures. Yeah. Next question is from Robin, um, and he said, um, here in Chesterfield, within our association, we have been doing many of the things we've been advocating, including educating the public and supporting all pollinators, rather than taking up beekeeping, when the reason for taking it up wasn't primarily to be uh, a beekeeper, but trying to save bees. And I think, as you say, yeah, you mentioned this, and I think this has been a problem in, in some of the large cities with London, with uh, the density of honeybee uh, the colonies on the top of buildings, which, um, because it was quite a, a trendy and fashionable thing to do, uh, unfortunately, they've become almost too many in some cities, unfortunately. Do you want to comment on that at all? Just, yeah, to, thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we advocate and, and exactly what we find here. And I get so many, I speak to so many beekeeping associations say, oh, it's amazing, there's so many new members. And you know, it is fantastic, but we just need to make sure that they actually want to become beekeepers, that they don't want to just see bees, as you say. Um, so, and again, you're right, John, is that there's so many studies now that are shown, particularly in urban areas, that the density of urban beekeeping is not always sustainable with biodiversity. And we need, I think, to work together, you know, the, the ecologists on, on the wild bee side and the beekeepers, we need to work together to make sure that we balance the two. And I think, you know, that's what we've, I hope that we've started doing and that we will continue to do. Right, okay. Um... Right, okay, this is Mary, and she says, any suggestions on how to deal with Gunnera? Uh, where I'm from in Mayo, County Mayo, there are fields that were once hay meadows, completely taken over and destroyed by Gunnera. Is there anything that can be done without using chemicals? I suppose that happens for quite a number of other wildflowers, as, or uh, wild plants as well. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Mary. And, and I've been to my own and break your heart to see some of the areas, you know, where Gunner has spread and, and also other invasive species when you know what, you know, could be there and what would have been there in the past. And I will say that Mayo is a stronghold for the great yellow bumblebee, you know, probably our most threatened bumblebee in Ireland. And it, and it really is it's heartbreaking to see, you know, habitats that, that could be supporting it, but that aren't because of invasive species. It's really difficult and, you know, we don't advocate the use of, of pesticides, but there are cases where you do need to use them and invasive species is one of them often. So often it is a case where, you know, you may have to use chemicals to control some of these species um, because, because there simply aren't other alternatives. And there's always research happening, you know, to try and identify other options. But as I say, 
in the case of invasive species, it, it, it may be a case you know, that you do still need to use chemicals to, to try to get them back under control. Yeah, I think uh, for those of us who are maybe a little bit further afield, because I understand we have a listener from Norway, uh, Gunnar is, um, uh, is a, a wild form of, of rhubarb, uh, and it produces huge, huge leaves, which um, I think probably tend to um, uh, really dry out, really, what any, any other plants are allowed to grow, they can't, they can't compete with them. And I think it's the same, and certainly it's a major problem, and I think uh, only you showed a photograph of Himalayan balsam, um, and Himalayan balsam, uh, and certainly in where, where I live in Northern Ireland, Himalayan balsam is extremely common. Now the trouble is, it provides very, very good um, pollen and nectar for uh, for bees, but at the same time, I think unfortunately, it's a plant that drowns out or completely competes with other plants, and uh, and therefore takes over vast areas. Um, and I'm not really quite sure, as you say, I think only the landkeeper, landowners can just try to, to try and keep on top of it if they can, but very difficult to eradicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see, our next question really is from uh, Francis Benton. Um, um, is a risk of pollinator friendly sites also becoming uh, effective breeding grounds for non-desirable species, such as ticks, potentially increasing the spread of human and or animal diseases? Really good question. And it's the kind of thing where it would be fantastic, I suppose, to liaise more with the likes of yourself. You have much more expertise on this than I do. Um, it's something that we're very aware of. So obviously we're continually trying to promote this don't mow that it grow approach, which means a lot more longer grass um, right across the landscape. I think, and I suppose staying on top of the evidence from Ireland and from elsewhere in Europe, you know, there's a lot of urban areas where that's okay, but there are other areas where we need to be really careful, particularly respect to ticks. Um, so it's something that we try to stay on top of all the time. Um, but if there are people who are more experienced and who can offer advice, we're always really grateful for that. Um, and again, often you know it's about identifying risks to people and I think in a lot of cases the risks are very small and in terms of the benefits that you're getting for biodiversity for pollinators but it is certainly something that we need to be we're very aware that we need to be conscious of that and, and to stay on top of that as, as things progress within the plan and we are seeing more of these areas where you could potentially get um you know let's say ticks and, and other insect and other um disease carriers yeah. Uh, I think certainly yeah, there is a really concern within the veterinary profession about the spread of ticks, uh, especially from Europe, and there are actually unfortunately mm. some very undesirable species are bringing in uh, not necessarily not diseases for bees or anything, like but certain diseases for, for animals, yeah, and yeah. some very nasty ones at that. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is yeah. a, a thing of the greater um, alliance of the spread of animals. Uh, they're allowed to do this, and I think whether we need to go back maybe to a more um, uh, you know, policy really of having a more quarantine involved. Mm -hmm. However, that's another story. But I think the other thing indeed is we need to, uh, as I say to the beekeeping organisations, is to emphasise on the um, keeping healthy bees because there is concern uh, about the transfer of, um, of honeybee diseases to wild pollinators. Yeah. And indeed, that does seem to be a one-way street where it goes from honeybees, say, to bumblebees or whatever. But it doesn't seem to go the other way. So we, we have to be ensure is that we do have very healthy bees. Yeah. Uh, right. So from Bruce here, so just wondering, does the increase in light pollution create problems? And if so, um, is there an organised plan to make the situation better? Yes, yeah, another really good point. Um, it's not, there haven't been a huge number of studies on this, but yeah, it certainly seems like the case that yes, light pollution is an issue, particularly for, for things like moths. Um, and we know, you know, that the very white or blue lights are, are not great, the ones that we have traditionally have used. So I suppose it's about once a sufficient evidence base is in place to make sure exactly what alternatives you're suggesting that we need to push that out. You know, so, so we're always developing these new guideline documents, then the plan on the next one is for new housing developments, and there will definitely be an action in that one around light 
on the lights that are installed in these new developments and to make sure that they're as biodiversity friendly as they can be. So yeah, it is an important point. And I think going forward, I hope it's something that we can start tackling as, as more evidence from the science side feeds through to tell us exactly what it is we should be um, recommending. Right, no, that's a very, that's a very, uh, I have to say that's a very interesting, interesting question and a very interesting idea because I, I do know, say, I think as you are aware is that light is possibly changing the, the life cycles of a lot of insects potentially and, uh, and what effect that would have in the long term. Uh, come back to, to, to Mary, it says, if you do use chemicals in the gunnera, does it kill the wildflower seeds in the ground? Yeah, good question. It's hard to answer. Um, it won't kill them all. Seeds are remarkably resilient and soil has really large and diverse seed banks that last for decades. So you will certainly kill some of them. And I suppose the more sensitive things like orchids that have, you know, relationships with fungi and things will be, will be more affected than others. But it won't kill everything in the seed bank. Um, what you might find is, you know, that... Yeah in cases where you're trying to rehabilitate maybe a meadow that you can come to some agreement you know where you're reseeding it with green hay or, or brush harvest that seed from a nearby species rich grassland so there's solutions around that it will obviously pesticides you know are, are harmful to everything but it won't it won't kill all the seeds and you know getting rid of the gunnera is it has to be the priority in those kind of situations right okay i think as you said this is one of these problems is that uh uh, is a garden centres and everything do sell a wide variety of very nasty chemicals that are used by gardeners to kill this, that and the other. And really, uh, you know, I think all gardeners should really be looking at this very carefully of what they're actually spreading onto their soil uh, because what can get washed away into waterways and everything else and, and be pollutant. Um, uh, and certainly I think it's whether or not that particular industry needs to be maybe brought more under control. Anyway, uh, really, I think really we could finish off this evening. Uh, um, you know, really, it's more just uh, not a question, but it's really a comment from a lady called uh, Yasmin Chinov, who is speaking to us from Ottawa. And she said, here in um, rural area outside Ottawa, I am following a lot of your suggestions and noticing beautiful farmlands being ruined to build houses on. So unfortunately, that is uh, a comment of the day, unfortunately, what is what is happening. And indeed, there are so much other problems. I suppose the, the only thing I tend to think of, uh, you were talking about hedgerows, is the huge destruction of hedgerows in, in Ireland and also in Britain as well because of uh, really um, agricultural subsidies, which I think is a, an appalling um, a policy. And hopefully this is going to come to an end. So... Una, thank you very, very much indeed for that was an excellent talk. And I do hope that all our um, um, uh, all our listeners, in fact, have enjoyed that. And I hope you'll be able to take away some, some of the points that you've made. And certainly I would recommend that anybody would visit your website and, uh, and will gain a great deal from it. So uh, to everybody, uh, really, is this is the second of our three webinars next week. We have Professor Stephen Martin from Salford University, who will be speaking on honeybees fighting back against Varroa mites. Uh, Professor Martin is a world expert on Varroa, and um, I would certainly encourage you to, to listen in to what he has to say, because there's been great um, um, progress in how um, uh, honeybees are indeed fighting back against Varroa mites. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for listening in this evening, and uh, I wish you all a very good evening. Goodbye.